So, I think we should start. We are a little bit under time pressure. And uh, we begin with an official part. Um, as many of you know, and many have contributed, uh, there was this nice idea from Mayan Prevotnik, who could not attend the Congress, uh, the in European past president. He had the idea that many of us uh, give a gift to the organizers of this conference. Uh, the gift is that we bring books from our national library, from our research, from our uh, national art education uh, organizations. And I collected in the recent days quite a lot uh, of these books. They are here in the corner. We were two men walking with books, chests, bags, and so on. And I said to Ruth, I bring and we bring the books in. Now we give you the gift and you bring the books out. <laughs> so, with many thanks for this marvelous conference, well organized, beautiful atmosphere, great presentations. Thank you very much and here is the gift from us to you. Since I carried, and even Mark, here, here is, uh, he helped me. What are you doing? Oh, demonstrating his strength, yes, he took these two bags. I took this, uh, this, this, this thing over there. I only take these small things, they are not so heavy, only as a symbolic gesture, but all those books are for you and thank you again very much. And now it's up to you. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, just a few notes also. Um, Glenn asked me to remind you um, that you can have uh, a lot of postcards uh, from him. Um, here you see Glenn um, in SIA information. So please go to Glenn and get a card to remind in SIA. Thank you very much. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening, friends of in SIA and from everywhere in the world. I'm very pleased to present to you now um, Leslie Ann Noel. I'm very pleased, it's a long way you have been coming. We met each other last year in Chicago. I was very impressed about your talk. And uh, let me say something shortly about Leslie. She's a lecturer of the Department of Creative and Festival Arts and the Arthur Lockjack Graduate School of Business, both at the University of the West Indies, St. Augustine campus. She has worked as a consultant with development agencies such as the Export Promotion Council of Kenya, Caribbean Export, the International Trade Center, and the Commonwealth Secretariat, focusing on product design as well as export product development and entrepreneurship training for micro and small entrepreneurs in Africa and the Caribbean. She has exhibited work at design exhibitions in Trinidad and Tobago, Jamaica, Brazil, Germany, France, and the USA, and has presented peer-reviewed papers at design conferences in Caribbean, the United States, United Kingdom, and India. Leslie, the stage is yours. Thank you, Ruth. So, good afternoon, everybody. Um, well, actually, since we have a selfie up there, I'm going to start with a selfie as well. Right, why not? <laughs> so, <who's in> <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm starting um, this presentation with a happy photograph uh, from a camp that I p participated in over the summer. Um, in North Carolina, where I currently live. And um, this was a camp, uh, this was a workshop on industrial design for 10th and 12th graders um, uh, in, who went to school in North Carolina. But the happiness of this photograph doesn't actually show the, the angst of the preparation process um, for the workshop. And um, 
in preparation for the workshop, I was challenged in so many ways. Um, every sentence of the course outline was challenged for no apparent reason, and it really derailed me um, for a while. Uh, my 25 years uh, teaching experience, because I started teaching at age three, <laughs> right? Um, my 20 years of design experience, um, everything was really being questioned, um, and I just couldn't place the issue, right? Um, was the content really bad? Uh, was it because I was a person of color? Was it because I was a woman? Was it because I was speaking with a strange accent that people couldn't understand? What really was the, it, the, the issue that caused so much conflict in the developing of this course outline um, for this one day camp? So it's just a six hour workshop that I was doing in industrial design and really the most basic content and we just couldn't um, move forward on it. And really, it reached a point where I finally had to say, well, okay, 25 years teaching experience, trust me, right? And that actually silenced everything, and the person said, well, okay. Actually, no, she didn't even say okay. We just moved on from there, right? Um, but actually, adding to that anecdote, I, I have notes, and then I'm going to add a little bit. I have a note here where um, my teaching assistant for the one-day workshop um, who's Indian and was born in Pune, um, but he himself had lost his own accent within one year. He offered to help me change my, my drawing style so that it would look a little bit more like industrial design drawing. And I really had to think, how did we reach this point where only one perspective is acceptable in industrial design, only one, um, f one style of drawing is acceptable? So, all of that contributed to the development of this workshop, which really is about developing curriculum in a kind of way. So, um, I, I really battled with the title of this presentation for a, a very long time, right? Um, and the current name of the presentation is um, imperatives for design education in places that are not in Europe or North America, which of course is a little bit different to um, what is in your program, right? This is a regional um, European conference, so this might not be the place to ask this question, but I would like, I'm still throwing it out to you, if you were born outside of North America or Europe, could you raise your hand? And I'll ask again in Portuguese in case my friends are here. Se você uh, nasceu fora da América do Norte ou da Europa, ou estudou fora, okay, great. Yes, we have a lot of people who were born outside of North America and Europe. Um, and so this talk is really for you, right? Um, so, now I'm going to start. Good afternoon, boa tarde, buenas tardes, um, masicati, right, to you all, and thank you for being here. Um, to the people who I said good afternoon to, please ensure that people know that you were um, that that you were born outside of Europe and North America, so that people are aware that there are people who practice design outside of these spaces. Because sometimes it does seem like you are invisible if you are not from Europe and North America in a design space, right? Um, but yes, yeah, so good afternoon, and every, everybody. Thank you, Louise and Ruth, uh, for the invitation, right? And I'm hoping to bring to this um, conference, and maybe this is what you were thinking of, a slightly different or radically different perspective, right, of design education and of curriculum development in design. And I'm hoping to share my perspective with you through a highly personal um, story that eventually will get a little bit more technical, I suppose. But um, we're gonna talk about serious things, but maybe in a less serious way um, in this talk. So my talk is divided into three parts. First, I want to share with you a little bit of who I am. Um, and in part two, I look to some of the origins and aims of the industrial design curriculum, uh, which is the discipline that I'm most closely related to. And then in the third part, I'm looking at the possible future ideal curriculum for non-European and non-North American students, um, thinking specifically of the context 
uh, that the UN calls vulnerable de developing countries, and I'm from one of those. So, I grew up in Trinidad and Tobago in the 1970s and 80s, and I'm from a black middle class family, and I had a um, pretty happy and comfortable childhood. Around 1990, I fell in love with design, specifically with the field of industrial design, um, and when I started applying to universities around the world, actually, <laughs> to study, I kept asking myself, how can you do industrial design if Trinidad and Tobago doesn't really have the industry to support it? Uh, there was no undergraduate degree in, in design at that time in Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, fortunately for me, in 1992, I got the opportunity to go to Brazil to study graphic design. But by 1993, I had switched to product design, and I spent most of the 1990s in Brazil. My university experience was a very political and socially conscious one. Uh, my roommates were anthropology majors, and my professors did research with an anthropological and ethnographic focus. In Brazil, I was actually able to understand and leverage my own privilege um, which I had not, I was not aware of while I was in Trinidad. Um, this was my privilege as an English speaker. Uh, and I was able also to use my difference and my exoticism to my advantage, and I had a very successful career at school in Brazil. My greatest takeaway, though, um, from my educational experience in Curitiba, in South Brazil, I'll say obrigada, <laughs> right? Um, my greatest takeaway is a quote from one of my favorite professors, Evans Fontora, which is, if you are looking for a job at the end of this program, then this is the wrong program for you. In this career, you have to make your own job. Uh, and really, my friends who studied in North America never got this kind of um, advice. And I think that this really shaped the kind of career that I had or have. <laughs> So towards the end of the 1990s, I headed back to Trinidad to Tobago, and I did just that. I made my own jobs, and I cobbled together design and academic practice that has been related to different design disciplines. My practice has focused mainly on training and export development projects with craftspeople in the Caribbean and East Africa. Some product design, such as this musical in instrument, called the FI, as well as an import-export business and retail outlet for craft called Shik Shack Lifestyle, which I operated for seven years. I eventually gave up my baby Shik Shack Lifestyle to be able to focus on my new baby and bigger design project, Azure Noel, who, um, funnily, when I arrived here, when I saw Ruth, she says, where is Azure? Because everybody sees me all the time with my son, Azure. And, she thought that I was bringing him, and I really would have brought him if his grandparents didn't say no. He has to stay at school. <laughs> so as we raise a bigger pro project right now. Uh, my academic practice as an educator at the University of the West Indies, and now a PhD student at North Carolina State University, has also taken me to several conferences, and my writing has focused on design curricula for university students and craftspeople in the Caribbean, design students in vulnerable emerging economies, elementary school children, emancipatory research methods, and policies to promote design in Trinidad and Tobago. As coordinator of the visual arts program at the University of the West Indies, I built relationships with primary schools to bring them into the university and to get university students to practice several service learning projects um, by collaborating with children and the community. The last image, these last two images are related to a collaborative book design project with the community where children in a rural community told stories to the university students, and in some cases, they also illustrated these stories, and then the university students took their content and um, developed finished products, um, actual books that we then took back to the community um, to support their literacy program. And this actually, um, or these projects are actually like the starting point of my own PhD interests. <laughs> So I've had radically different educational experiences throughout uh, my professional journey or my academic journey, starting first at UFIPEHI in Brazil, 
then moving on to UE and the Arthur Locke Jack Graduate School of Business. Both, in, well, they're related institutions and I studied at both of them and teach um, at both of them. And finally, now I find myself living in the south of the United States at a very difficult time for black Americans where I'm doing a PhD um, at North Carolina State University. Um, I am a Fulbright scholar. So the typical perspective um, at art and design conferences that I've attended is that of the student, academic, or professional who was born in and educated in Europe or North America. I recently learned something about um, a syndrome called imposter syndrome, which refers to high achieving individuals marked by an inability to internalize their accomplishments um, and they're persistently scared of being exposed um, as a fraud. I never really felt like this before. But actually, in the space that I'm in now in North America, and sometimes coming into these conferences, I do find um, myself more often in this unfamiliar space where I find myself questioning, OK, what do I really know? OK, or do I know what I think I know because of the types of questions that people ask me because I'm such an unfam unfamiliar face in these kinds of spaces? So in my speech, I am looking at the future of design education for people like me and the people who I said hi to, <laughs> right? Um, that is people who were not born in Europe or North America and who were born and will be educated in and will practice in developing countries. What is our future design education? Okay, what are the imperatives of design education for us? So everybody knows who this is, right? Anybody not sure who this is? <laughs> this summer, we all watched in amazement as Jamaica, a tiny country of less than three million, dominated track and field. And all of the news reports kept asking, how did Jamaica become the world leader in track and field? What explains Jamaica's global dominance over track and field? It actually is not genetics, as a lot of people want to say. Um, even Usain Bolt will talk about yam and the typical foods, but actually it's not that, right? According to Orlando Patterson of the New York Times, it is the most, um, the reason that most Jamaicans will actually give you for the success is something called the champs track meat, track and field meat, okay? Which is a secondary, primary slash secondary school um, track forum or you know a series of races and I actually was once in Jamaica during the champs um, tournament and I couldn't find anybody to do any kind of social activity um, with me because champs is so important uh, you know in Trinidad where I'm from who's gonna go to a primary school track meet nobody the stadium will always be empty but in Jamaica it's different uh, champs is like it's like the World Cup Right, being, it's like being in Brazil during the World Cup. Uh, this image is of Jamaica's first gold medalist, Arthur Wint. Uh, he's winning a gold medal in the men's 400 meter race in the 1948 London Olympics. His Jamaican teammate, number 90, is Jason McKinley, and he won the silver in that same race. So we see here that Jamaica has had a long history of track and field. Um, that even goes, even predates that 1948 Olympics. Norman Manley, Jamaica's first prime minister, was a medalist for the first champs school track meet in 1911. Other causes of Jamaican success, again, according to Patterson, have been listed as including a public health campaign that promoted healthy bodies and healthy minds and the natural confrontational and competitive character of Jamaican people. If any of you know Jamaicans, if, if you have any Jamaican friends, you know that Jamaicans are always ready to fight. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, not literally fight, but they are aggressive, right? And in the rest of the Caribbean, we look and say, okay, why are you Jamaicans so aggressive? Calm down. But it's listed as one of the characteristics that has led to their success. So Jamaica has been able to create its own athletic program that produces excellence despite the economic conditions or lack of resources. 
Uh, Usain Bolt actually said in one of, well, he has a recent um, biography, and he said that he would have been ignored in um, the American track and field system because he's too tall, he has scoliosis. He has a lot of issues that would have kept him out of that system, and it is, a, it is the Jamaican system that built him. So what does Usain Bolt and the Jamaican track um, team's prowess at the Olympics have to do with design education in the developing world, you all wonder. The point is that Jamaican success is due to homegrown curriculum, a homegrown curriculum over 105 years. The athletic program is not a poorly done copy of an athletic program from some other part of the world. It takes into account the culture and the context of the country and its people, and it produces excellent results. Can locally grown design curricula have the same effect in the Americas, Africa, and Asia? Okay, stop to take it. <laughs> you brasileiros estão aqui? No. <laughs> Any Portuguese speakers, though? Ah, okay, we have some Portuguese. Ah, <laughs> okay. Então, olá. <laughs> So I studied product design at Universidade Federal do Paraná in Brazil in the 90s, as I said earlier. And at that time, despite being a pretty Brazilian curriculum, the curriculum at my school was almost, uh, was a very close replica of the curriculum at the Ulm School of Design. Uh, the Ulm School of Design, as some of you would know, opened in 1955, a decade after the Second World War, and a decade of rebuilding in Germany and one of its aims was to foster constructive political behavior. It closed in 1968, a year which again we know was marked by global social unrest. The program at Ulm modeled the Bauhaus Art School, which operated from 1919 to 1933, and began with a fundamentals year, which was common to all students. The foundation um, program at Ulm was abolished in 1961, after which pro professionalization courses began from the first year. The program at Ulm was much more multidisciplinary than the Bauhaus program, and it included subjects such as sociology, psychology, writing, graphic design, product design, and architecture. The educational concept was to combine design with teaching and to also develop research. Collaborations with industry were also a mark of the model at UM. The school went through three, phrase, three phases. Um, this was one of the iterations of the curriculum. And so they went through three phases in the development of the pedagogy. The foundation phase from 1953 to 1958, where its Bauhaus roots were more obvious, and there was a concentration on visual training of the eye and hand. Next came the scientific, scientification phase from 1958 to 1962, which focused on developing methodologies for the design approach. And finally, 1962 to 1968 was marked by design practice influenced by the social sciences. By the third phase, each discipline had its own foundation course. In each phase, the foundation course also underwent various changes according to the positioning of the approach. So there is much to learn from the 15-year um, experiment at Ulm, and it has last, uh, left a lasting impression uh, on design education and a pretty strong base all around the world. It's actually no coincidence that the curriculum at UFPAEHI and many schools in Latin America resemble Ulm so, so closely, since many of the former professors and students at Ulm took up residence in Latin America after its closure. The approach of the UL model is actually a, a good place to start our discussion on design education um, in the future and design education in, in our socially charged context. So moving across the Atlantic, um, this is NASAD, which is the National Association of Schools of Art and Design. This is their current recommendation for curricula, curricula in industrial design, which again is the discipline that I'm from, where they're recommending 30 to 35% of the total programs as studies in industrial design, 
25 to 30 percent supportive courses in design related technologies and the visual arts, 10 to 15 percent studies in art design, histories and theory, and 25 to 30 percent general studies. So there's a little bit of a difference. Yeah, entering. <laughs> right, there's a little bit of difference in the focus um, of the curriculum when we move across the Atlantic. So studies in industrial design um, in America, uh, well, design, design technologies, visual arts, that's supposed to comprise about 65% of the curriculum. And recommendations for general studies are for studies in the physical and natural sciences, social and behavioral sciences, quantitative reasoning, and humanities. Um, and it's important for students to be able to make connections between the various disciplines in their work. Again, this seems like a pretty sound base for design education um, in the Caribbean, Latin America, Asia, Africa. Um, but what else might we need? So a few years ago, I was doing some research to develop a design curriculum at um, my university. And I came across this statement quite by chance by Professor Ken Friedman in his paper, Models of Design, Envisioning a Future Design Education. So it's, it goes like this. Since most design professions involve shaping goods and services within large industrial economies, this political economic context is one key to the realities of design education today and tomorrow. And here, Professor Friedman ties the political and social context of design education to large industrial economies, which I'm not from. So Professor Friedman's statement was so profoundly offensive to me, um, albeit unintentionally, because of course he wasn't writing for me anyway, but it really, um, it was so, let me see if I could find my point again. It was, as I said, so offensive it was exclusive, it was dismissive, in a way that I'm sure he did not intend. But I don't even remember what the rest of his paper was about, but years later, I'm still stuck on this, that he thinks that you can only practice design or industrial design if you're coming from a large um, context. And he is one of the most preeminent uh, figures, I suppose, in industrial design anyway. So it, for me, that was a problem. But I liken this, however, to some of the other microaggressions and acts of exclusion that I and other people of color, other women, um, other others, we sometimes experience um, in our design practices and, and research. As a person of color and as a woman living in North America, I'm often invisible. In discussions at the university, I have to fight to get a word in edgewise um, over my two white male classmates in our class discussions. And we're all very good friends, but they are, it's just a group of five of us. They are not even hearing the women in the room. And while I'm the woman and the person of color, it is a conversation between two people and the rest of us just, we're talking, but they're not hearing because we're just invisible, right? Um, and this is a, a this is the kind of thing that happens very often um, if you are black and female. Um, maybe in general, but I also see it in design. So by Professor Friedman's statement here, I read this to say he, that he is saying that this profession is not for me. So I'm asking you all to think of a few questions. Um, what is the relevance of design practice and design education outside of a large industrial economy? Isn't design practiced out of this, outside of this type of context? Don't design schools exist in some places that may not be large industrial economies? And note, Professor Friedman, Professor Friedman is not speaking specifically about industrial design. He's talking about design in general. So I have to ask you all this. So while the reality might be that most design professions and design schools operate within large economies, according to Professor Friedman, as a person from a very small country, I'm forced to wonder about 
where I'm from, what should design education look like for somebody who lives on a rock in the middle of a, an ocean? While the need for design education is more obvious in large emerging economies such as Brazil or India, it may seem less obvious in smaller, less industrialized economies um, where there's no critical mass of design, uh, of designers, maybe no apparent public appreciation um, for design. Is there a need for design education in these places? Are there any unrecognized opportunities for designers and design educators to play a role in the development of these countries? Are there any benefits to promoting design education in a non-industrial context? Is there any benefit to stimulating design in places with little or no design or manufacturing culture? How can design education and design research support development of these types of societies? And my questions go on. More questions. How can design and design education serve people who live in these types of places? How can design and design education use, like the athletics program in Jamaica, the varied culture and context of these environments to create relevant design curricula to serve these populations? How do we create a global view in design education that is not a hegemonic Western view and a repeat of curricula from the West? How do we create curricula that are relevant to poor countries or small places, non-industrialized places, etc.? So, as I said, Professor Friedman's statement stuck with me for months. And to prove a point, I looked at a category of countries that the United Nations considers the most vulnerable developing countries. Because I felt if we could find a need for design in the poorest places or the most vulnerable places in the world, I must be proving Professor Friedman wrong. So, <laughs> I looked at landlocked developing countries, small island developing states, and I'm from one of these, um, least developed countries. Designer skills and services are needed in all developing countries, but what role could they play in the development and progress of these most vulnerable countries? So the first group, the category of least developed countries. This was established by the UN in 1971 uh, with the aim of attracting special support to these vulner vulnerable members of, um, of the association. So these countries are the poorest segment of the international community and comp comprise approximately 12% of the world population. So that's 880 million people. But they account for less than 2% of the world GDP and about 1% of the global trade in goods. Their economies are primarily agrarian and are affected by low productivity low in and low investment. Few of these countries have been successful in diversifying into the manufacturing sector and the product range that they produce is limited and labor intensive. Example, textiles and cloth clothing. The current list of LDCs includes 34 countries in Africa, 13 in Asia, and the Pacific, and one in Latin America. And some of their main challenges are rela related, as I said earlier, to low productivity, low investment, lack of diversification, and the labor intensive nature of their industries. The next group, landlocked developing countries. Um, this, there are 31 countries, and of this, 30, 16 are also LDCs, and the total population of LLDCs is 429 million. 15 of these countries are in Africa, 10 in Asia, four in Europe, two in Latin America, and in 2012, actually, yes, that's, I call that statistic already. That's the population, 429 million. So these countries lack access to the sea, which results in isolation from world markets and creates high transit costs, which impact their economic development. Most are exporters of a limited number of commodities, and their sea trade depends on transit via other countries. With the exception of landlocked countries in Europe, in most cases, the nearest neighbor, so the nearest trading partner, is also a developing country. And so they don't have access to markets, to larger markets. Um, challenges, therefore, are related to transportation, logistics, and the high cost of transit, which have a serious impact on trade. And small island developing states. This, this actually is a photograph from Tobago. So you guys can all come and visit. <laughs> So SIDS are confronted by a plethora of problems. 
So, yes, including a narrow resource base, small markets that deny them to um, access the economies of scale, um, small domestic markets, heavy dis dependence on external and remote markets, high cost of energy, infrastructure, the list goes on and on and on, right? So um, it's a group of 39 countries, the total population is 63.2 million, and they are scattered all over the globe. And they are really, um, they're a group that really face a significant amount of um, environmental problems and problems related to access. So you all know the hashtag first world problems um, and the hashtag third world problems. So here's a, a, a summary of the types of problems that the LDCs, LLDCs, and its SIDS are facing. So it's really just not enough to take the curriculum of a design school in the developed world um, and transport it to a design school in the developing world because the problems really are so radically different. Um, so, <laughs> I was going to say something and then I hold, held it back, but in, I'll actually yeah, say it, right? Even in the, the most developing countries, the most vulnerable developing countries can benefit from the skills that are developed in design education. And I would prefer to see designers born in and trained in the developing world play a key role in developing solutions to these problems with which they are so familiar. So this now I'm throwing out to, um, to my colleagues who I've had several informal conversations where, where people talked about um, taking design students and going to other parts of the world to, to help, right? Um, and I will speak now as an educator at a design school in the developing world. Please don't bring your, <laughs> your art students or your NGOs to come to help unless you're thinking about the impact um, on the designers and the design students who live in those places. Right? And what is going to be the lasting impact or the perception of them as designers when you come in to save the world? Right? Unless you're going to see how you're going to consider collaboration, it's probably not going to work. So I think that design education, we're really looking at, and I'm, I'm really taking somebody else's um, quote here. We're looking at these five questions. Um, asking the right question, making sense of things, creating concepts, prototyping, and communicating. So these are the five skills that we're looking at. But design education in the developing world, because there's so many issues, we have to add all of this to it as well. Social responsibility, environmental responsibility, anthropology, social justice, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Design challenges during secondary education and later on um, tertiary education and in professional life can use our key design talents to improve industrial products and processes, to focus on the improvement of the basic standard of living, to promote behavioral change, to address logistics and transportation problems, to create more opportunities for the private sector, and to develop very specific responses to address challenges in each context. While design education at primary level can play a role in building 21st century skills, such as oral and written communication, critical thinking, problem solving, teamwork, empathy, facilitation, collaboration, etc. My own PhD is focused on this aspect of design education. Uh, and I will be working with children at a rural primary school in Trinidad um, and helping them to build these 21st century skills through design. So, I've attempted to redraw the curriculum inspired by UM and the needs of citizens in the developing world, and in particular from vulnerable economies like mine. And in the center, I have designed thinking as a non-discipline specific process that leads to sense making, creating concepts, prototyping, communicating. In the orange ring, I place the social science awareness that must support our design projects, and the outer ring has the larger problems of the context in which we live. And it's a work in progress, so in a, a later version, I might invert the content of the two rings in the future. 
some of you will say, but okay, it's not that much different um, to our design curriculum in the first within in inverted commas. And you also might say, but this is too much. There's too much content there. But the reality is life in our part of the world is different. And a designer very often has to wear so many hats when you're living in this hustle or struggle that we really need an education that supports us changing all of these hats. Right? I actually blame the lack of context um, in the education for some of my colleagues' um, inability to switch, to readjust, to practice in life in the third world because they've been educated outside and they really don't understand then the compl complexity of design practice where we're from. So we come back to the title, right? Imperatives. What is an imperative and why did I use that word? Well, an imperative is a command. So the question is, what is, of, um, what is the command? What is of crucial importance? So in my own classes, my imperative is, what, is that I produce empowered and confident students through culturally centered curriculum. And I'm hopefully not imposing a foreign aesthetic on them, but leading them through an at times confusing, fuzzy, and frustrating design process. But I ensure them that they can compete anywhere. My friend Eric asked me at a recent conference, what makes you so confident? And I had to respond to him, my confidence is from my solid grounding and belief in my own perspective and individuality from my education in Brazil and Trinidad. I've been thinking about some of the key words for, or, or the imperatives then of design education um, for people in the developing world. And so I would urge my colleagues in future when you're designing curriculum, desist from adopting or, or just borrowing the curriculum from another place and start to understand the context a little better and see where they can get these keywords from that will guide their process. Thank you.